In the movie The Martian, Matt Damon plays astronaut Mark Watney, who's part of a six-person crew on Mars. Now, Mark Watney's specialty on the team is dirt. He's there on Mars to take soil samples and analyze them. And through a crazy set of circumstances, Mark Watney gets stranded on Mars and left for dead. And knowing that it's going to take three to four years for any kind of a rescue mission to take place, he begins to figure out a way to survive for that long in a hostile environment. The NASA structure that he is in has plenty of water and has plenty of oxygen. What he's lacking is food. But he does discover some potatoes that were supposed to be part of a Thanksgiving dinner that the crew never got to share. So using those potatoes, Mark Watney sets out to grow more potatoes on Mars. <laughs> he creates a greenhouse and he fills it with Martian soil. He figures out a way to water the soil. And this is gross, but he even uses human waste as a fertilizer for the soil. But whether he lives or dies all comes down to the condition of the soil. Because if the soil is good, there's a greater chance that something good can grow. If you're visiting with us online or on TV, or you're visiting with us in person, welcome. We're so glad that you've chosen to join us in worship today. And you've, as Scott has mentioned, you've picked a great week to jump in because we are beginning a brand new series called Dirt, based on a story that Jesus tells. Now, Jesus was a master storyteller. And he told stories using everyday situations that people can relate to. And so over the next four weeks, we're going to look at a story. The Bible calls these stories parables. We're going to look at a parable Jesus tells in Matthew chapter 13. Now, most Bibles will title this parable the parable of the sower or the farmer scattering seed. And, and while the farmer and the seed play a role, this parable is really about the soil, specifically the four different kinds of soil that the seed will fall on. And before we get started looking at this story, it's important for us to, to understand that the conditions of the soil that Jesus will describe in this story represent different conditions of the human heart. It might surprise you to know that the word heart appears 725 times in the Bible. But it's almost never used in reference to this thing inside of our chest that pumps blood throughout our body. In fact, the first time we see this mentioned in Scripture is in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. God is observing the state of humanity on earth and says that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. Here, the heart is where thoughts and evil intentions lie. And that's just the first of many examples where the heart is described as the center of emotions and character. All throughout Scripture are grief, desires, joy, sorrow, fears, understanding, thoughts, and reasoning, and maybe most importantly, our faith reside in the heart because it's the heart that shapes who we are and what we do. Now, I have two kids. I have a 20-year-old daughter and a 23-year-old son. And when my son, Josh, was 10 years old, I started having those conversations that you have with like a 10-year-old boy as he starts to look in, into like the th cell phones and like the digital age and watching stuff on TV. And so I sat him down one day and we revisited this same conversation throughout his teenage years. I said, Josh, you need to be very careful what you look at on your phone or on TV or what you listen to. Because what you see with your eyes and hear with your ears, it begins to rattle around in your mind. And from your mind, it makes its home in your heart. And once it's in your heart, it will come out of your life. From your eyes and ears, into your mind, to your heart, and out your life. 
This concept is why Solomon wrote in Proverbs chapter 4, above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. And it's pretty impressive, as many as the wise things that Solomon said throughout Scripture, that he would say, like, the most important thing I'm going to tell you, above all else, make sure you guard and protect your heart. And this is why Jesus tells a parable about different kinds of soil, because Jesus is concerned about the condition of our hearts. Each week in this series, we're going to look at a different soil that Jesus describes, and chances are good, you're going to relate to one or more of these kinds of soils. Some weeks you're going to be encouraged, and some weeks you're going to be challenged. But we pray overall that you would see this story for what it is. It is an invitation from Jesus for you and I, for our hearts to become the kind of soil where good things can grow. So again, we're in Matthew 13. We're going to read the parable Jesus tells, and then we're going to read the meaning that he shares with his disciples. So would you please stand with me as I read this out of respect for God's word? Beginning in verse 1. The same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such, a large, such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it while the other people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. And as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow, but when the sun came, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let him hear. Now skip down to verse 18. This is the explanation of, of this parable. Listen to what the parable of the sower means, Jesus told them. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they only last a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. This is the word of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Please go ahead and have a seat. And before we jump into our soil of the week, all right, let's, let's pause and take note of just a few things. First, Jesus is talking to a large crowd. So large is this crowd, in fact, that they're on the shore of a beach in, in, uh, on a lake, and Jesus gets into a boat and goes out into the water a little bit, and he uses the water as like an amplifier for his voice so that everyone on the beach can hear him. And I would imagine the crowd that's listening to Jesus tell the story then is similar to the crowd that is watching online or on TV or here this morning. Jesus' ministry has been going on for a little while, and so some people hearing this story have been following Jesus from the beginning. They've been following him for a while. Some people are newer to their faith, and my guess is that some have kind of heard about Jesus, but they're just coming to hear him because they're not quite sure who he who really is. Is he really who he says that he is? The point is, Jesus is speaking to a diverse group of people. And he's inviting everyone to hear this story and benefit from it. So regardless of where you are in your faith, there is something for you in this parable to hear and apply to your life and even share with others. But the other thing to note is that the seed is the word of God. That the farmer scatters the same seed, the same word of God on all the different kinds of soil. Each soil 
is given the same opportunity to see growth. Now, with all of that context in mind, let's look again at this first soil Jesus describes. We're going to start about halfway through verse 3. A farmer went out to sow his seed, and as he was scattering the seeds, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Skip down to verse 19. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed along the path. Now, farmers back then did not have the modern equipment we have today, right? And so what they would do is they would literally walk through their field and they would scatter the seed as far as they could and it would just fall wherever it would fall. And they didn't want to trample through the whole field, so they would trample over certain parts of the ground, And they would walk on the same spot over and over as they scattered the seed, causing it to be a hardened, well-worn path. So that the seed that fell on it couldn't sink in, making it easy for the birds to come and take it away. And at first, when we hear Jesus' explanation about this soil We want to start to think that people, the reason why some people, their hearts are hardened is because they're hard-headed. Like Jesus talks about not being able to understand the message of the kingdom. But that's an incomplete picture. Because Jesus is talking about the ability and desire to receive the word of God. That for some reason, people's hearts have become trampled. And that they are unable or unwilling to receive, not just in their minds, but in their hearts, the word of God. And it makes me think, you know, all too often when we have issues in our faith, where we're struggling in our faith, we feel distant from God, our our first thought, our first inclination is to question the quality of the seed, Like things aren't working out, like we're trying to do what God's word says, and then we still have struggles. And so we start to go, like, is this thing real? Like, is this relevant for today? Does this have any application for my life? And it's okay to ask those kinds of questions, but rarely, instead of of questioning the quality of the seed, rarely do we pause and question the quality of the soil of our hearts. Rarely do we ask the question like, is my heart in a place that I'm able to hear, receive, and do what God's word says? So there's an overarching and simple question we're going to spend the rest of the morning looking at together, but it's important. How's your heart? Is your heart regularly receiving what God's word says? says. Let me maybe ask it this way. Is God's word shaping your life? Is it guiding your life? Or has your heart become hardened, not able to receive what God's word has for you? You know, just the past few years alone, there's enough stuff that's been going on in the world that could have caused our hearts to harden a bit. We turn on the news or we get on social media and we see the anger and the division and the violence and the chaos and all that's broken in the world, all that we've taken into our eyes and our ears that's rattled around in our brains a little bit, that's maybe made its way down to our heart, taken residence there and hardened them a bit. And that's just the stuff that's happened around us. Then there's the stuff that happens to us. The disappointments and the betrayals and the hurts, the mental or physical challenges, these have a way, if left unchecked, of hardening our hearts over time. So again, how's your heart? You know, the problem when we have a hard heart is that it's difficult to determine if you have a hard heart. Like, this is why we don't self-diagnose heart conditions, right? 
Instead, what do we do? We go to someone we trust, we go to a doctor, and they run some tests on us, and they tell us the condition of our hearts. And so what I want to do for the next few moments is look at some symptoms of a hard or hardening heart. And I would challenge you, don't just listen to this and like self-diagnose. I would encourage you to ask a trusted friend or ask a few trusted friends, ask a significant other, ask your kids, ask your parents, are any of these symptoms present in my life? Here's the first symptom of a hard or hardening heart. Cynicism. A cynical person is someone who is deeply distrusting of others, typically because their heart has been hurt by others. It's been trampled down quite a bit, and it's become jaded and hardened over time. Psychologists tell us that cynical people are often pessimistic, like they see the empty side of every glass. Uh, cynical people are also often very sarcastic. Maybe you've seen the TV, sh- uh, the, the TV commercials or the, the shirts or the, the mugs that say, sarcasm is my love language. You've seen these? Or sarcasm is my spiritual gift. I, I have friends that have both of those t-shirts. Actually, chronic sarcasm is a sign of cynicism. And a person who is deeply distrusting of others, including God. Now, before we go on, I want to say, because I'm watching it happen a little bit already, that as I'm going through these symptoms, these are for you to listen to for you. All right? There should be no elbowing of your spouse (laughs) or your friend next to you saying, yeah, I think this might be you. I think this might be you. Right? I'm already watching it happen. Okay? So this is for you to ask other people, like, are these in you? These are not for you to, like, point out to others. All right, so that being said, here's another symptom. No elbowing. Here we go. Easily angered. Like, it doesn't take much to make you mad. And chances are good that if you're easily angered at people, you're also easily angered at God. Like when things don't work out the way you want them to, when he doesn't show up in your life like you want him to. And obviously, if you're easily angered at God, you are not going to receive what God's word has for you. Here's another one. In gratitude. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 30 says, A heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. Like if you spend more time thinking about what others have, then you are grateful for what you have. That is not a heart at peace and a heart that is prone to become hardened because you don't see or can't see all the good that God has done in your life to this point or even the good that he's doing right now that you may not even be aware of. What about this one? Unwilling or unable to forgive. So prevalent is this one in our lives that we are going to spend several weeks in a whole different series on forgiveness here pretty soon. But when I see someone who is unable or unwilling to forgive, that's typically the sign of a hard or hardening heart. Being disconnected from our emotions is another symptom. Now, Not everyone emotes how they feel, right? You know, some people are super expressive and some people are super reserved. My wife tends to be lean towards the more reserved side. And uh, she's one of the more even-keeled people that I know, which is one of the many things about her that I love. However, there is a season, and I have permission to share this story, where that was not the case. Uh, She was pregnant with our first child, and I was coming home one day for lunch, and I was super excited to come in, and I see her. She's sitting on the couch, and she's watching TV, and she's sobbing uncontrollably. And it really freaked me out. Like, I had never seen her like this before. So I was like, honey, are you okay? Like, do you feel okay? Like, what's the matter? How can I help you? Turns out, She was watching Star Trek The Next Generation. (laughs) 
and the scary Klingon named Worf had died in that episode. Now, for those of you, you know, spoiler alert, he comes back to life in the same episode. But somehow, like, that hit her, and she bawled her eyes out right there on the couch. Interestingly, like, the same thing happened a week later. I came home, she was bawling her eyes out, watching TV. She had just watched an elderly gentleman win a car on The Price is Right. <laughs> and she, she's bawling like a baby, right? Needless to say, it was an interesting season in the Harrigan household. And look, I'm not suggesting that we should just all become weepy. Like every TV show, every commercial. But I do think we need to be reminded that Jesus wept. That he wept when he lost a friend. That he wept over people not coming to faith. Like, I think we need to be reminded that Jesus felt things and expressed himself emotionally. Like, Jesus' heart was soft and open to everything that God wanted him to hear and do all the way to the cross. And it's not uncommon, especially for guys, to not express themselves uh, and not express ourselves very well because it wasn't maybe modeled for us growing up. And when emotions become buried for long enough, it can cause us to become unaware of what God might want us to feel and experience. Like his love for us, his freedom and grace that comes through Jesus, the compassion that he has for us that he wants us to have for people when our emotions are buried long enough, we can become disconnected from them and our hearts can become hardened to what God has for us. Here's the last one we'll look at. Insensitivity to sin. The apostle Paul was writing to a church he helped start in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 17 when he wrote, so I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do, those who don't know and follow God. And here's how they were living. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity. And they are full of greed. Paul spells it out pretty clearly. Like if we ever get to the point that we are not bothered by or convicted by our sin, or we find ourselves doing things that are directly against what God's word says, that is a clear indication that our hearts may become hardened or have already been hardened. So how's your heart? Are any of those symptoms present in your life? Again, I would challenge you to ask someone that you know if any of those symptoms are there. And we've already talked about how unhealed trauma can cause our hearts to harden. So I won't go into that anymore except to say this. You are not the sum of your past failures or what other people have done to you. We just spent the last 14 weeks going through the book of Revelation where an overarching theme of the book is the fact that God can and will restore all things. So if you've got unhealed trauma in your life, if your heart's been trampled a little bit, you need to know that it's possible over time for your heart to be softened. As you place your life into the hands of a loving God whose scripture promises is close to the brokenhearted, who saves those who are crushed in spirit, who wants to walk with us through dark valleys, who wants to comfort us when we mourn. Sometimes the soil of our hearts becomes hardened because of unhealed trauma, but sometimes God's word can't sink in because we don't think we need it. We think we're okay, even better off 
on our own. And so we just do things the way we want to do them, however we want to do them. And God's word can't sink in and take root. That as much as God wants to do a work with, within us, we choose not to listen to anything he has to say. Listen to these warnings from Proverbs. The wise in heart accept commands, but a chattering fool comes to ruin. The Lord detests all the proud of heart. Before his downfall, a person's heart is proud, but humility comes before honor. These are harsh words. And we go like, why would God detest the proud of heart? Well, it's because God's got plans for your life that are better than your plans and that will produce the kind of fruit in your life that both honors him and truly satisfies. But a proud heart won't receive anything that God has, allowing Satan to come and to take the seed that God wants to sow. And so if you find yourself at any point having a hardened or hard heart, the best and first thing that you can do is to pray, ask God to, asking God to soften your heart. David, when confronted by his rebellion against God, stood before the Lord and said, God, create in me a clean heart. In the book of Ezekiel, the nation of Israel was struggling in their faith and God promised to remove from them a heart of stone and to give them a heart of flesh. God promised to soften their hearts. And God wants to do that in us, but he is not going to force his way into the soil of our lives. Like we've got to invite him in. We've got to invite God to do in us only what God can do. We've got to ask God to soften our hearts. And once we do that, you need to open your heart to God's word by reading it. Now, I recognize that some of us grew up in some religious environments where you were never encouraged to read the Bible on your own. You were just told to take whoever the person up front is word for it about what the Bible says. And so maybe you don't know where to begin. And there are some wonderful tools out there to help you grow in your knowledge of God's word. Pastor and author Mark Moore has a couple of great devotional books out there. The first one is called Core 52. This is 52 weeks through some core scriptures in the Bible. You can find both of these books that I'm going to mention on Amazon. Core 52 is a good tool to use. Quest 52 is another book that he wrote. 52 weeks on walking and growing in your walk with Jesus. Like spend a few minutes every day praying and reading because if God's words what causes the growth, you're only going to see growth when you read his word. But James chapter 1 verse 22 tells us, don't just read God's word, but do what God's word says. Like obedience is a wonderful way to soften our hearts. And I want to be careful because I know some of us are stuck in this system where we believe that if we do the right things, that God will love us. That if we do the right things, that God will accept us. And you can't do things to earn God's love. He already loves you. You can't do things to earn God's forgiveness. If that were the case, then the cross is meaningless. No, we do what God's word says because we trust that God's plans are better than ours. And we know that God wants to create within us the kind of soil where good things can grow for our families, for our friends, for our community, for our church, for the kingdom of God. Author uh, Dallas Willard in his book, Renovation of the Heart, writes, the greatest need you and I have the greatest need of collective humanity is a renovation of our heart. That spiritual place within us from which outlook, choices, and actions come has been formed by a world away from God. Now 
it must be transformed. Indeed, the only hope of humanity lies in the fact that as our spiritual dimension has been formed, so it can also be transformed. Friends, God is a God of second chances, of rebirth, of transformation. And God wants to do a work in your heart and in my heart to soften it so we will be receptive for God's word to sink in so that good things can grow. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for your word. And God, we pray that you would soften the soil of our hearts to what you would have for us to hear, to do, to become. Not just for our lives, but God, for a world that is searching and lost. God, soften our hearts, even as we respond to you now in worship, that we would follow you and listen to you and know your love in our lives. God, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.